We acknowledge that we are on traditional lands, referred to as Treaty 6 territory, and the homeland of the Métis. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of all First Peoples of Canada by engaging in truth and reconciliation with a spirit of peace and friendship. Welcome to our Remembrance Day service. My name is Karen Johnstone, and this is Dr. Catherine Kirk. We will be leading the ceremony today. The year 2021 marks the 100th anniversary of the use of the poppy as a symbol of remembrance. The Canadian Encyclopedia gives the following history of the red poppy. The red poppy is a symbol of Remembrance Day that was inspired by the poem In Flanders Fields, written by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. Red poppy pins are sold by the Royal Canadian Legion and worn by millions of Canadians in the weeks leading up to and on the, the 11th of November. The red poppy grows on the first World War battlefields of Flanders in Belgium and Northern France. The poppy as a symbol of death and renewal predates the First World War and dates back as far as the Napoleonic Wars in the 19th century. The seeds of the flower may remain dormant in the earth for years, but they will blossom in abundance when the soil is disturbed. As the artillery barrages began to churn the earth in late 1914, the fields of Flanders and Northern France saw scores of red poppies appear. The first person to use the poppy as a symbol of remembrance was Moena Michael, a member of the American Overseas YMCA, who had been inspired by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields. Michael pledged always to wear a poppy, a red poppy of Flanders Fields as a sign of remembrance and the emblem of keeping the faith with all who died, which is a reference to a line in the poem. McRae wrote his famous war poem in 1915 at a Canadian dressing station in Belgium, taking his view of the poppy-strewn battlefield as artistic inspiration. On the 9th of November, 1918, Michael shared her pledge with her colleagues who asked to wear poppies along with her. The next day, she purchased 25 silk poppies, pinning one to her coat collar and giving the rest to her colleagues. <clears throat> Over the years, she worked to popularize the poppy as a symbol of remembrance. The National American Legion adopted the symbol at its conference in April 1920, after hearing Michael's campaigning. Anna Guerin of France was inspired by that same campaign. She too had been touched by McRae's poem and became a vigorous advocate of the red poppy. Guerin started the American and French Children's League, which sold cloth poppies to raise money for people suffering in war-torn France, particularly orphaned children. In 1921, she traveled to Britain and Canada and persuaded both the British Legion and the Canadian Great War Veterans Association, which was a predecessor of the Royal Canadian Legion, to adopt the poppy as their symbol of remembrance as well. The first Poppy Day in Canada and in Britain occurred on the 11th of November, 1921. Millions of poppies were brought to Canada from Guerin's organization in France. They were supplemented by cloth poppies created by Canadian women. Members of an organization known as the IODE, the Imperial Order of Daughters of the Empire in Winnipeg, also made poppies. Coincidentally, my great-grandmother, Edith Nordheimer, was elected the first national president of that particular organization. In 1922, lapel-worn poppies were manufactured and distributed by veterans in Canada. The Royal Canadian Legion, formed in 1925, has run the poppy fundraising campaign in Canada ever since. Today, millions of Canadians wear the bright red emblem as a symbol of remembrance. The Poppy Campaign raises funds to support veterans and their families. 100 years ago, an inspiring woman had a vision, a bright red poppy to honor veterans who lost their lives in the First World War and to help raise support funds to help others in the aftermath. The idea was conceived by Madame Anna Guerin of France sparked by John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields. Anna had originally founded a charity to help rebuild war-torn regions of France after the First World War. 
Poppies made of fabric were sold to help her charity. She presented the concept to France's allies, including the Great War Veterans Association in Canada, which later became the Royal Canadian Legion. The idea was adopted, and the poppy symbol made its first appearance in Canada on July 6, 1921, the year of the first poppy campaign to support our veterans. To mark the symbol's 100th anniversary in 2021, the Royal Canadian Legion produced a replica of the original fabric pin. The familiar image has come to reflect the sacrifices of fallen Canadian veterans from all arms of the military and from all missions, including two world wars, Korea, Afghanistan, Bosnia, peacekeeping duties, and other assignments. Canada's Parliament entrusted the Legion with the exclusive right to use the poppy as the nation's symbol of remembrance and to safeguard its image, a pledge it honors today. 100 years later, the symbol is unmistakable. Its meaning still deep. The poppy of remembrance honors sacrifice. Poppy of Remembrance cries never again. Poppy of Remembrance reflects solace and support. Anna Gadea's vision lives on. To learn more about how the Legion helps veterans, visit legion.ca. Each year, our teachers encourage the students to submit entries to the Remembrance Day poster, poem, and essay contests. Our first student reader today is Cooper Cattell. The poem he is reading is the poem he wrote last year, which placed third at the provincial competition. Cooper's reading will be followed by the grade one class reciting the poem, Poppy, Poppy. Bloody. Pale, dead bodies lay restless in the fields. Gunshots, reloads, grenades, all have them in the fields. Canadian, Russian, German, Korean soldiers all fought in the fields. Field hospitals, concentration camps, prisoner of war camps were all in the fields. Bombs, mustard gas, smoke bombs were all dropped in the fields. Trenches, horses, tanks were all in the fields. Friendships, relationships, memories were all lost in the fields. Blood, sweat, tears all happened in the fields. Pain, death, bullets all were in the fields. War happened in the fields. Poppy, poppy, what do you say? Many are remembrance Poppy, poppy, what can we tell? Here's the soldiers of battle fell. Poppy, poppy, what do we know? Peace on earth should grow and grow. Superhero. He wasn't from Krypton. He was born in Canada. He never wore a cape. He was draped in fatigues. His superpower resided in a rifle, and his ability to fly came from a machine. His strength wasn't inherited, and his body was flesh rather than steel. His weakness wasn't kryptonite, it was the pierce of a bullet. He wasn't born from a celestial being, he was a child of God. Although mentioned in a paper, his name was a statistic. He wasn't idolized, his stories weren't purchased. He wasn't immortal, he was human subject to death, loss, age, and hunger. He never had a signature tune. He was sung at dirge. He never saved the world. He saved his motherland, liberated his people, sacrificed his soul. He died in the mud, not a man, but a hero, a real superhero. Thank you to the grade one class and Mrs. Logan for their hard work in preparing their poem to perform for us today. And thank you to all the students who contributed poems, essays, and posters to this year's contests. Special thanks to Carter, Alexis, and Cooper, who also recorded their work for us to use today. 
Mrs. Jolene Niedermeyer will now announce the winners at the local level of the Legion Literary and Poster Contest. Hi, I'm here to do the Remembrance Day uh, certificates for 2021. I'd like to thank everyone for putting all your entries in this year and we will commence with the winners. So we'll start with color posters with grade two. First place is Everly Blind. Second place is Carter Kazmar and Olivia Turchin. Third place is Aubrey Svanda and Carly Wild. Grade three winners. First place is Aaliyah Singer. Second place is Michael McIsaac and Boyd Summers. Third place is Hudson Summers and Jace Lance Abishon. Grade four winners. First place, Mason Waldorf. Second place, Dave Penner and Aries Pettit. Third place, Paisley Curry, Connor Kidner, and Kaysen Rollick. Grade five winners, a first place is Hayden Summers. Second place is Tania Lance and Kinley No. Third place is Leah Osimimau and Braxton Kazmar. Grade six, first place winner is Jackson Ford. Second place is Sawyer Erin McGilvery, Jillian Burgess, and third place is Brianna Erlocker. Grade seven color poster winner, winners. Uh, first place is Drayden Assant. Second place is Slade Blind and Leland Burchill. And third place is Reed Hadover. Grade eight, first place, Ryder Grutner. Second place, Rihanna Slavinger. Grade nine, first place is Layla Constant. Second place is Renee Larson. Grade 10, first place, Megan Johnson. Grade 12, first place, Audie Candesami. Black and white posters for grade six. First place, Jackson Ford. Second place, Braden Wild and Cohen Ferris. Third place, Ashton Fear and Hunter Steeles. Grade seven, first place, Carmen Warren. Second place, Lainey McDougall and Harlan Schreiber. Third place, Abby Stacy and Georgia Parker. Grade eight, first place, Merrick Jaros. Second place, Michaela Slavinger and Rain Chartrand. Third place, Cody Pickwich. Grade nine, first place, Nathaniel Newdorf. Second place, Skylar No. Third place, Tristan Hadiburg. Grade 10, first place, Braden Sayer, grade 11, first place, Sierra Morin, and second place, Canyon Summers. So on to the literary portion. So the poems, the winners for grade six, first place, Cohen Ferris, second place, Ashton Fear and Jillian Burgess, third place, Reed Hadiber and Tatum Williamson, grade 10, first place, Foster Pickwich and Aaron Niedemeyer. Second place, Macy Ashby and Dacia Loden. Third place, Carmen Frolic. Grade 11 winners, first place, Colton LaCourcier. Second place, Amber Billings and Sarah Curry. Third place, Cadence Johnson and Sierra Morin. Grade 12, we have um, a tie for first place uh, with a few, uh, few of the kids. We have our Ripley Grutner, Dara Schreiber, Rory Gretner, Ashton Frolic, Charlie Parker, Kyle Niedemeyer, Keegan Frolic, and Carter Gretner, all with first in their poems. Essays for grade seven. First place winners, Taylor Kazmar and Cooper Cattell. Second place, Abby Stacy and Georgia Parker. Third place, Jed Shaw. Grade eight, first place, Ayanna Connolly. Second place, River Pettit and Merrick Jaros. Third place, Triton Weiss and Ryder Gretner. Grade nine. First place, Layla Constant. Second place, Leon Baer and Renee Larson. Third place, Rhett Erlocker and Carson Kazmar. Grade 10 winner. First place, Alexis Johnson. Grade 11, first place, Camden Burnett. Second place, Joshua Lance and Spencer Wooland. Third place, Kiana Kohut. And grade 12, first place is Abel Aguilar. Second place, Eric Wapis and Salisha Wapis. We'd like to thank everyone for their entries again this year. 
and have a safe and happy Remembrance Day long weekend. And we'll see you all next year. I grew up with many friends whose fathers or grandfathers had served in one of the world wars. As many of us learned, few of those veterans talked with their children about their war experiences, choosing to downplay their own roles. My grandfather fought in World War I. As a child, all I ever heard from him was that he had been a gunner. I wish I had been wise enough to pursue that. Only after his death did I learn that he had fought at Vimy Ridge, Long, Ypres, and Passchendaele. My father was a World War II veteran. All he ever told his young children was that war was not nice and that he had been in signals, so not usually at the front line, minimizing the importance of his part in the war. 50 years after World War II ended, I learned that my father had served with the first Canadian radio location unit active in England in 1942 to 1943. Its work was experimental and top secret, but it was used successfully to accurately track and shoot down enemy planes, an important part of the defense of London, England. The unit was disbanded when the Canadian Army came under the command of the British Army and few or no records exist. There are thousands of similar stories, some of them still coming to light, and it is up to us to continue to discover and tell these stories. I am so pleased that Alexis searched out her great-grandfather's story, a slightly different story, and she is going to share it with us today. Have you ever wondered how your families came to live in Canada? Did they come to have a better life to join family that were here? Or were they adventurers looking to see what Canada was all about? Or were they looking to escape the horrors of war? I know why my mom's family came here and it was for one reason only. I couldn't imagine the uncertainty my grandma, my grandpa Theodore Caban faced. Unlike many Nazi soldiers in the Second World War that were there for their leader Hitler, my grandpa was under his command not by choice, but to survive. When I was little, he didn't like Remembrance Day and I wondered why. I now know it reminded him of the horror he had to overcome to survive. My grandma told me a little bit about how they left their home to come to Canada, not knowing anyone and with no money. Before the war started, life for my grandpa Ted seemed pretty normal for a nine-year-old boy. He lived on a farm with his mom and dad and five siblings. I'm not sure the exact day, but it was in April when the Germans raided his home. Two guards smashed in the door, demanding that they turn over any young male adults in the house. Ted's mother refused and tried to hide the boys under her bed to protect them. But the Germans were too smart and had spies everywhere. They knew that they were there and destroyed everything looking for them. They hit Theodore's mother over the head with a rifle, leaving her unconscious, never to see your boys again, as they dragged the boys out from under her bed. The Germans loaded the boys into a wagon and left. My grandpa never cried and I un never understood why. But my grandma said they cried, they were beaten. Tears showed weakness. The next few days on this horror ride, the boys were beaten because they cried. Ted was quick to learn how the Germans worked. He didn't cry, he accepted what they dished out to him no matter what. It was on the last day that the wagon that his younger brother wouldn't stop crying. So they stopped the wagon, threw him off and shot him and carried on. Later that day, the wagon rolled into an area that was full of people. He didn't understand what this was at first, but soon realized he was hauled to a Nazi concentration camp. And the sign said Auschwitz. He realized he was doomed. The smell of death, people crying, confusion, German soldiers shouting orders, and so many people. A German soldier grabbed Ted and a few others and marched him at gunpoint to a building, full of boys similar to his age. He was then told, you will live if you do as we say, no matter what we ask, disobey, and we shoot you. Next, he was a living hell. They were training Ted to be one of them. Ted was starved, tortured, and abused until they believed what he had to, to, to be one of them. They placed him at a border crossing to make sure no one could escape Germany or come in. He was ordered to kill anyone, even though, even people that were his own nationality. Months went on and the Germans saw that he could kill for them. Pleased with that, then they moved him back to Auschwitz. Only 12 to 13 years of age, the Germans turned him into a killing machine. But to not face a bullet, it was them or him. His new position as Auschwitz was a guard at the gates. Anyone escaping was to be shot 
at that it was his duty. Looking down at the barrel at the end of the life of one of his own could never have been easy or to do to erase out of his memory. Two years of this went on, and by that, Ted didn't decided he could not take this anymore. He ran. As he was running from his spot, he felt something hit his leg, but that never slowed him down. Fear and survival kicked in, and he knew just to keep running. Ted fled to a refugee camp in Britain. He was terrified that the Germans were coming to get him. Ted met my grandma at this camp. Even in the darkest time, lives love showed shines through. Ted told her he was going to Canada to get away to start a better life for them. He sailed on a ship, leaving her behind, pregnant with his son. Ted promised he would send her money when he earned enough to bring her over to Canada. It took over a year working for a farmer, then landing at a job at CN Rail at Laverna, Saskatchewan. But he sent the money and he, she and his son knew nothing about. They had met him at the train station at Laverna. They were all safe. A new life to never look back at what they had to overcome to get to Canada. My grandpa always wanted to go back to Ukraine to find his family, but Ted was scared because he had to run from the Germans. He believed that they would kill him. He said there were lists of men that ran. Without the bravery and commitment my grandpa demonstrated, our family would not have ended up in Canada. This is just one of the millions of the survivor stories, but this is ours. I am grateful he was brave, not to serve Hitler, but to survive the events he had to go through at his age. When he passed at the age of 82, he had a piece of a bullet in his leg. He had carried a piece of history around him for that many years. It was a story he avoided telling and tried to forget, but I'll remember forever. Today, we honor the members of our communities and our families who sacrificed so much for our freedom. The Royal Canadian Legion, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Canadian Veterans, William Ainsworth, Archie Barton, Harry Britton, Norman Britton, Tom Britton, Gunnar Erickson, Leonard Forsyth, Ronald Forsyth, William H. Fry, Arthur Gayton, Matt Gelowitz, Tony Gelowitz, Arthur Guthrie, Doris Guthrie, Bill Hogan, Clifford Johnstone, Charles Kirk, Bill and Mary Kisselbeck, George Little, Daniel Logan, Les Mitchell, Mary Mitchell, Ted Nixon, Leon Roberts, Leonard M. Schmally, George Shirley, Melvin Stacy, Ivan Stonehawker, John Stonehawker, John Schwartz, Ernest Bayan, Al Wilton, George Whittingham. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. DJ Esso. GPR Signs, Progressive Industries, Pierce Cafe, Pierce Land Hotel Motel, Pierce Land Grocery, Site, Ushers Contracting, Beaver River Ranch, Bow River Energy, The Family of Robert and Leslie Brunette, The Family of Brent and Laura Usher, Cougar Towing and Automotive, Sea King, MPS, North Country Enterprises, Pierce Land Agencies, Pierceland Central School, Pierceland Credit Union, Pierceland 4-H Beef, Village of Pierceland, Uptown Treasures. Please stand for the last post, followed by a moment of silence, reveille, and a song played on the bagpipes. <laughs>
Standing at the big stone At the end of Main Street Reading names etched into the bronze Thoughts bittersweet Maple leaf flying up above Snapping in the breeze And I'm thinking and I'm thinking Lost in the reverie They were boys and they were girls They were brothers, they were wives They didn't need to do it Save for that voice inside Left home to the call of battle Just hoping to see it end And no amount of praying Was gonna bring them home again And the trumpet plays the last post silence tells the truth And I think of mothers crying When they got the letter with the news And this little red flower I'm wearing on my coat 
I'm wearing it for fortune, I am wearing it for hope. You can kill the soldier, you can wound the soul. But freedom wears an armor for battle to behold. And I'm humbled by the bravery And I try to understand And I promise to remember Through these tears I'm holding back And the trumpet plays the last post The silence tells the truth And I think of mothers crying When they got the letter with the news And this little red I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope It's the old gray politicians That send us into war And the young ones head off fighting Not knowing what's in store So on a cold day you know of all of them and for a few precious minutes we hear their ghosts whispering and the trumpet plays the last pose the silence tells the truth and I think of mothers crying when they got the letter with the news and this little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope This little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope and the trumpet plays the last pose The silence tells the truth And I think of mothers crying When they got the letter with the news And this little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I am wearing it for hope You can kill the soldier, you can wound the soul But freedom wears an armor for battle to behold And I'm humbled by the bravery And I try to understand And I promise to remember Through these tears I'm holding back and the trumpet plays the last post The silence tells the truth And I think of mothers crying When they got the letter with the news And this little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope it's the old gray politicians that send us into war And the young ones head off fighting Not knowing what's in store So on a cold day in November We think of all of them And for a few precious minutes We hear their ghosts whisper And the trumpet plays the last pose The silence tells the truth And I think of mothers crying When they got the letter with the news And this little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm 
wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope This little red flower I'm wearing on my coat I'm wearing it for fortune I'm wearing it for hope Carter has done so much work for us over the years, and as he is in grade 12, this is the last year he will be organizing a lot of our technology. We really appreciate all he has done for us over the years, and we're really going to miss him and all his creative ideas and skills. Thanks also to Mr. Millie, Mrs. Troniak, and Mrs. Niedermeyer for all their work to make this ceremony possible. Thank you to all the students who contributed entries to the literary and poster contests, and to the teachers for encouraging them to do so. If you would like to make a contribution to our local Legion branch to help with our contest awards, or to add your name to the list of supporters that we read each year, please contact Mrs. Jean Troniak to make those arrangements. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>